The time period for this story is the early 1970s. The location is England. A nurse in full uniform loads up a big syringe with a cloudy liquid. She carefully extracts the fluid from a small bottle, then ejects some to eliminate air gaps. She places the syringe on top of a metal trolley, which has two small opaque bottles sitting on its top tray. She walks, with purpose, along a long hospital corridor, passing the many doors and various treatment rooms. The floor is highly polished, and at regular intervals, there are chunky white radiators and red fire extinguishers attached to the walls running along either side. Above her head, harsh white strip lighting shines down, providing bright and clinical illumination. She glances through some open doors. In one room, there is a youngish man with shoulder-length dark hair sitting on the edge of a bed in his pajamas. He is rolling down his sleeve after having just received an injection from, presumably, a male doctor who is standing over him and looking stern. The injected patient's expression is forlorn. As the nurse continues down the corridor, she comes to a huge fire hose reel bolted onto the wall. She slows down here and turns her trolley into a side corridor where the overhead lighting is much dimmer. Halting next to a shiny door marked with a number 12, she peers through the small spy hole set at eye level. Her spy hole view shows a hospital bed illuminated by clean white light in an otherwise bare room. There is a gray blanket on the bed completely covering the person lying underneath it. The figure under the blanket is keeping very still. The nurse closes over the spy hole slot, takes a key from her belt, unlocks the door and eases open a gap in preparation to enter. She then pushes her trolley into the room and places it next to the bed. Inside, the room resembles a prison cell more than it does a bedroom. She closes the door and walks over to a small, high-up window to the right-hand side of the bed and adjusts the short curtain, revealing bars on the outside. She has left the syringe momentarily unattended on the trolley. While her back is turned, a hand quickly grabs the syringe. The nurse gets forcibly injected in her arm. A struggle ensues. The nurse falls to the ground. A minute later, out in a corridor, a security man is being approached by someone. He turns his head and is shocked by what he sees. He succumbs to a blow which knocks him violently to the floor. In the distance, a hospital orderly has been hearing a commotion and is heading towards room 12. When he gets there, he is stunned by what lies before him when he enters the room. Out in the night, on a lonely country road, the solitary driver of an Austin 1800 saloon car speeds along. Wearing a dark coat over a shirt and tie, he looks respectable. The bloke is maybe some kind of a businessman, or the like. He appears physically strong, and of the type who could probably handle himself. He stops his car on a dark stretch to use a telephone box by the side of the road. All around, it is pitch black, and the bright red phone box appears to be lit up like a beacon. He pulls the handbrake on firmly, switches off the engine, and gets out of the car. Casually walking towards the phone box, he swings the door open and stands inside. The box is clean with internal lighting and is in full working order. The businessman shuts the door over and picks up the handset with his right hand. He dials with his left index finger. The circular label, marked Chenton 8421, spins around. He only gets a couple of numbers dialed before he hears his car engine turning over outside and starting up. The headlights of his vehicle come on, full beam. The businessman runs out of the phone box. His car is being driven away. Standing out in front of its path, he shouts, Hey! and waves his arms about. But the car thrusts forward and hits him, full on. He bounces off the bonnet with force and rolls over the windscreen. His limp body crashes to the ground. The car stops a short distance away. Someone gets out, leaving the engine running. A hand checks over the body lying on the ground, searches through the clothing, and takes the valuables. The figure then slowly walks back to the stolen car, jumps in, and drives off at speed. In the darkness, someone is breathing heavily and running through the woods. Their rapid footsteps pound on the leaves and twigs. Inside a nearby house, a couple in their mid-twenties are relaxing in their living room under subdued lamplight. The man is dozing on the couch while his wife is watching TV. The woman hears creaking and then smashing glass. She becomes anxious and nudges her husband. There's someone in the house, she whispers, worriedly. The man jumps up and grabs a big torch. 
The couple investigate the source of the sound and discover, to their distress, a wide open window and flapping curtains. Their main bedroom has been ransacked. Also, whoever did it has since ran off. The following day, a big tanker truck drives into the forecourt of the Roadhouse Cafe. It's a gray, damp, and winterish morning as the trucker walks across the tarmac towards the entrance door. He passes a blue Austin 1800 that is parked in a slot with some other cars. The trucker in his late thirties is wearing a black donkey jacket. He's an ordinary looking man with straight brown hair and a sturdy build. He breezes into the busy cafe and heads towards the cigarette machine. Bacon and egg please Doris, he shouts over to the waitress behind the counter in a cheerful manner. Standing nearby to the cigarette machine is a finer boned, good looking, blonde haired man putting coins into a one-armed bandit. His drink is sitting on top of the bandit and it looks to be a generous whiskey on the rocks. He carefully places five P coins into the round slot on top of the machine and pulls the handle. The trucker gets a packet of fags from the machine and doesn't waste any time in lighting one up. He walks over to the counter and takes a deep drag on his fag. Doris comes over. The usual please, he says. Doris, dutifully, heads over to the beer pump and begins to fill up a pint glass. The boss man comes over to speak to the trucker while Doris is pouring the pint. You're late today, Jim, he asks. Yeah, says the trucker as he drags on his fag. Some nutters escaped from Bromwood. Dangerous, the boss man asks. Yeah, they've got roadblocks all over the place, Jim replies. A young lady walks into the cafe. She's about 25 and has medium brown, shoulder length, neatly trimmed hair. She looks a bit out of place in this rough and ready trucker's joint. The blonde guy, standing playing a bandit machine, sees her entering, in a reflection, on a wall mirror. He turns his head around momentarily to gain a more direct look at the wholesome-looking woman who has just entered. The woman heads up to the counter. Excuse me, I want to get to Bromwood Station, she says to the boss man in her middle-class, refined accent. Well, there's only one bus on a Sunday, he replies while polishing a pint glass with a cloth and it left ten minutes ago. Yes, I know, she says, already resigned to this. Can I get a cab, she asks, politely. Not from here, I'm afraid. He pauses. Hang on a minute. The boss man walks over to Jim, the trucker, who's sitting at the other end of the counter. Jim's had a few by now. You're heading for Bromwood, aren't you? Yes, the trucker replies with slurred speech. But no passengers. The young blonde guy is keeping an eye on this from a distance. He heads over to the counter to settle up his bill with Doris, and also to get within earshot of the posh lady who is waiting expectantly for the boss man to come back over. The blonde guy looks presentable enough, wearing gray flannel trousers, a dark brown open jacket, and a light blue casual shirt. The girl is wearing a lightish colored coat with pockets over a dark open neck top with buttons on it and a loose fitting skirt. The pair would probably make a good match judging by their style, manner, and attire. Ah, oh, come on, says the boss man persuasively to Jim, the trucker. You can't let her walk, what, with a maniac on the loose? Jim looks over towards the innocent-looking girl standing by the counter, but with lecherous thoughts on his drunken mind. Jim and the posh girl walk out of the greasy joint and head towards his tanker truck. He helps her up the high step into the passenger side of the cab, she appears so small compared to the huge bulk of the truck. As Jim shuts the cab door over, he has a smug grin on his face. He clocks her legs as she enters the cab. This is my lucky day, and it's all too easy, he probably thought. Or maybe it was just wishful thinking. The girl sits on the passenger side of the big bench seat inside the cab. Jim bangs her door shut. This makes her flinch. She fixes her hair as her wide eyes adjust to the cab environment. Jim then appears through the door from the driver's side. As he gets in, he glances at her with a stupid grin on his face. She looks away, but inadvertently displays her legs as she crosses them. Jim takes a gasp of breath and then fires up the truck. As the truck rolls out of the forecourt onto the main road, the blonde guy from the cafe is standing outside watching them depart. The blonde guy gets into a blue Austin 1800, closes over the door, and then winds the window down. He doesn't start the engine, however. Instead, he produces a half bottle of whiskey and takes a swig from it. Out of the blue, 
there is the blaring sound of a police vehicle siren coming from nearby. The blonde guy quickly tucks his bottle away, starts up the engine of his blue Austin, and carefully drives over the potholes and puddles of the forecourt. He accelerates off onto the main road in the same direction as the tanker truck. Just a few seconds later, a white Rover P6 police car comes screaming along the main road at a crazy speed. The Rover swerves into the forecourt of the cafe and screeches to a halt. Two cops leap out and head into the cafe. The cops talk to the cafe boss man over the counter, showing him notes and pictures and asking him questions. The boss man dutifully answers. The cops then depart in a rush. Meanwhile, Jim is manhandling the big steering wheel of his tanker truck. What time's your train? He asks her. There's one at two o'clock. We can take it easy then, he pauses. Quick, get down. What? There's a roadblock ahead. I'm not allowed to give lifts. She dives down below the dashboard. He throws a coat over her. Two traffic police in high-vis jackets beckon Jim to stop. He does, then opens the cab door to speak with them. Where do you come from? One cop asks, while the other walks around the lorry, checking underneath. Birmingham. The guy at the rear of the vehicle signals all is okay with a thumbs up to his colleague at the front. Jim gets waved on. Back on the road, he pulls the coat away and she sits upright, again on the bench seat. I could lose my job, he says gruffly. She strokes the back of her hair. I can't thank you enough, she replies in her refined voice. Want to bet? He gives her a look. She realizes what she has just said and her eyes widen with concern. The truck driver has another good look at her legs. You a model, eh? He asks. No, she replies soberly with a slight laugh as if to say, don't be silly. You could be. He has another lech at her legs. You'll be glad I came along? I'm very grateful to you, she assures him. I hoped you'd say that, he smirks. Jim's head is darting from side to side as he looks ahead, trying to find an appropriate place to stop. He finally pulls the wagon into a deserted lay-by, putting on the air brakes with a clunk and a hiss. It is a cold, gray, damp, and miserable day. What's the trouble? She asks him with surprise and wariness on her face. He leans towards her. I thought we'd settle the fare. Jim then lunges towards her. She lets out a cry, fights him off, opens the door, and jumps out of the cab. It is quite a height, and she lands, heavily, down on the tarmac. She rolls over, quickly gets up, and runs towards the rear of the lorry. But Jim appears from around the back and grabs her. He roughly pulls her hair and shakes her about, trying to rip her coat off. There is quite a thick drizzle in the air, and they are both getting very wet as they struggle with each other. He makes a feeble attempt to kiss her on the neck. In the distance, there is a car speeding their way. Jim hears this looks up, and promptly abandons his attack on the lady. He gives her a look of contempt and, in a rage, throws her viciously at a nearby iron railing. She crashes into the rails and falls to the ground, puffing and panting. Jim darts off and jumps into his cab. Inside, he leans over and slams shut the passenger side door. He notices that her handbag is still sitting on the seat. He pauses for a brief moment and then throws the bag out of the window. The rain is now pelting down, and the girl is lying crumpled on the ground.